Um, so hello everyone and welcome to the 360 Speaker Series. I'm Curator of Education, Anna Smith, and today I'm delighted to welcome author and artist Edmund Duvall. Edmund Duvall is one of the world's leading ceramic artists with works held in public collections that include the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, Museum of Arts and Design New York, National Museum of Scotland, and the Victoria and Albert Museum. With the publication of his best-selling memoir, The Hair with the Amber Eyes, in 2010, Duvall proved himself to be a nuanced storyteller every bit as gifted with words as he is with clay. The intervening years have brought numerous accolades for Duvall, including a Costa Biography Award and the Royal Society of Literature's Ondaatje Prize for The Hair with the Amber Eyes, and a recent Wyndham Campbell Prize from, we from Yale University, as well as his, his first solo exhibition in New York. In his new book, The White Road, Journey into an Obsession, Duvall recounts an intimate narrative history of porcelain structured around five journeys through landscapes where porcelain was dreamed about, fired, refined, collected, and coveted. I know many of you are great fans of our guest's work and are eager to hear from him in person, so please help me give a warm welcome to Edmund Duvall. Thank you so much. I've been on the road and I've been jet lagged and not sleeping. I don't sleep normally because I drink too much coffee, but this is special, not sleeping. And in the middle of the night, I had this strange feeling that I was coming up to the Nasher, and I came all the way up to the door for the first time, and it was locked, and there was no one here. And I could just look in, and there were Cy Twombly sculptures and all kinds of amazing things, but I, the door was locked. And now I'm here, and the door is open. And what's more, there's an audience, which is absolutely terrific, and I couldn't be happier to be here. And what I'm here to do is to try and talk about a new and special thing for me, which is this white road. What I'm talking about is the attempt in my midlife to see whether I can work out why I am still making white pots. The very first pot I made was when I was five years old. Uh, I persuaded my dad who's a clergyman, to take me to an evening class. And, and, and we went there, and I went down to the cellar, because for some reasons they always have potteries in cellars. And I made a pot. And I remember intensely this experience, intensely this experience of the clay moving under my hands, the beginning of a vessel, the beginning of, a, of something emerging out of formlessness. And the next week, I went back, and the teacher, in her unbelievable, condescending way, said to me, now, dear, what color do you want your pot to be? There's this whole spectrum of different glazes and oxides and paints with which you can turn your little pot into something else. And I chose white. And I'm still choosing white. What is this thing of whiteness, says Melville? What is the experience of trying to make something white in a world which is so plural, so multivalent, so colorful? Why make white things? And what is it about porcelain? What is it about this extraordinary material which has traveled right across the world, which was discovered in China a thousand years ago in the hills outside Jingdezhen and changed the world, traveled everywhere? this object of obsession, this object of desire. There's something when you touch porcelain. There's something when I have it in my hands and I'm making a pot, which is absolutely extraordinary and elusive and fugitive. When you're making a pot out of a porcelain clay, you feel completely entranced by the present moment. You feel totally in this experience of something happening that could happen in any other space. But at the same time, you're utterly in the past. You're using a material which has been used for a thousand years. What is this thing of whiteness? In my studio in South London, I have two different spaces. At one side of the studio is this very modest space in which I make my pots, a potter's wheel. And on the other side of the studio, this is much cleaner than it normally is, actually. It's a totally fake photograph. It's been <laughs> scrubbed up to look like this. It looks like the Deer Foundation or something, but it's actually not. 
It's usually piles and piles of books. But the other side of the studio, you have to imagine, it's a huge factory. It's an old ammunition factory, but pots on one side of the studio with clay and kilns and tests, bins of clay. And the other side, books. 5,000 books and a space in which to write. But books and pots get muddled. Books and pots talk to each other all the time for me. And this is my current shelf. It's a shelf of shards, of objects, of this journey, of obsession, this white road. And in both spaces, I'm always writing on the walls. Whenever I have an idea, I'm making notes, I'm charting things, I'm putting down titles. And this is my script for my white road. I write down London, Plymouth, Venice, Jingdejen, Cornwall, Stoke-on-Trent, Jingdejen, the city in, in China, in the hills, Istanbul, Dublin, North Carolina, Beijing, Alach, West Norwood. West Norwood is the incredibly dull suburb in which my factory is. That's the places I have to visit. And this is a wall as big as this on which I write down all the books I need to buy and all the things I haven't done and all the people whose calls I haven't returned. But if you're going to go on a journey, you need a guide. And so for my first White Hill in China, I choose a very unlikely and wonderful guide. I choose a Jesuit, a French Jesuit of the 17th century. And this is advice for nothing. If you want a guide, choose a Jesuit. They're extremely organized people, <laughs> extremely good at lists, very good at note taking. They are the best guide. Get a Jesuit into your life straight away. <laughs> and this man was a young Frenchman born in Limoges, where they make cl clay. And he, he, he was ordained, and he was sent all the way around the world to China. And he writes in his poignant letter that I found, he says, after nine months on a terrible rackety boat, he said, I wish I died like some of my comrades. He had an absolutely miserable time. But he arrives in Jingdezhen, the city of porcelain. And he's wonderful. And I tell you why he's wonderful. He's wonderful because he loves people. He talks to people. He notices them. He looks at everything. And he notes it all down. So he's the first person who looks at porcelain. So I go to Jingdezhen. And it sounds unbelievably, irredeemably precious, but I take a photocopy of all his 17th century letters. So I'm standing in the city with these bits of French paper. Anyway, it's awful, but it's true. It's what I do. And I go up on my first day up into the green hills outside Jingdezhen, Mount Kaolin, where Kaolin, China clay, was first discovered. I'm there with my guide, and I'm there with my driver, and I feel a crunch under my foot, and I look down. And it's a porcelain bowl, a broken porcelain bowl from the Sung dynasty a thousand years ago. And I'm just, it's my great moment of epiphany. It's the heavens have opened. And they're laughing at me. And they're laughing at me because the whole hillside, <laughs> the whole hill is full of broken porcelain objects. And I stoop down and I pick one up. And this is it. So how, um, if you, I have it back before I leave Dallas, I'd be grateful. But <laughs> I have to say, I've been carrying this around now for five years in my pocket. And some of you may know that the last book I wrote, I carried an object around in my pocket for seven years, if any of you read it. And this is jolly sight more uncomfortable than a net skate. It's got... <laughs> but anyway, there you go. But as soon as I've got this object, and it is very beautiful, when you've got this fragment, this shard, this broken bit of porcelain in your hands, I have total knowledge that this is the right thing to do, total kinship, because this is what porcelain does. Porcelain goes wrong. That is the experience about this material. It goes wrong when you try and compound these two different white clays that you find in these hills in order to make porcelain. Any speck of dirt means it's contaminated and will go wrong. It goes wrong when you have it in your hands and you're trying to throw a pot. It warps and it moves like a sort of Art Deco dancer. It's ridiculous. 
And then if you've made something and you put it in the kiln, that's where the trouble really starts. <laughs> and then it goes glazed and then it's broken. But actually shards are part of my journey, the brokenness of porcelain. And from this extraordinary hill, Mount Kyolin, down over a thousand years, people have carried clay. Here they are carrying it down. And they carry it down to the river. And they bring it down it's two days down the river to Jingdezhen. And this is an extraordinary series of photographs taken in 1920 by an American photographer. And this mound here, you can see in the foreground, is millions of broken pieces of porcelain. And this is the city. It's a city where a, 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 a poet in the 15th century says that day and night are as one. In the day, there is so much smoke and fire from the kilns that you could be living in hell, and at night it's lit up with the fires, and it is even worse. Though admittedly, he also complains about absolutely everything else. <laughs> but in this city of Jingdezhen, my Jesuit, Père Dantricol, Father Dantricol, notices everyone, and he notices the emaciation of the potters. He looks down every single alleyway. He talks to people. He sees people grinding cobalt, like this man in a mortar. And he says that every space you've got in this city, they make porcelain. And when I go and spend my time there, even the railway tracks were being used for porcelain. The children were told to clear the porcelain off five minutes before the train came every day and put it straight back again. And he talks about everyone wheeling great carts of porcelain through the streets. And they're still wheeling carts of porcelain through the streets. And I have to say, my heart was in my mouth when I saw this chap, because this pavement was as bad as any Manhattan street. And it wobbled in the most terrifying way. But everything you see everywhere is people making pots. These are kids making pots. And they get paid enough, they said, for their mobile phones. And they end up like this, huge things going off to Dubai. Etc. <laughs> but also what he sees and what I see is the dust. Because when you make things out of porcelain, every time you touch this extraordinary, amazing material, there is white dust. And the dust is silica. It's free silica. It rises into the air like clouds. And every time you make something, you breathe it in. And when you breathe it in, it shortens your life. It clogs your lungs. It kills you. White dust is what they call potter's rot, silicosis. And here you see people ankle deep in white dust. This is the first place in my story, my first place, my first white hill, where the unbelievable purity, the extraordinary, incandescent purity of porcelain objects begins to be a story of the cost of porcelain. This object from the early Ming Dynasty by an emperor called the Yongle Emperor who loved the color white. He had the power to commission tens of thousands of porcelain objects. He killed tens of thousands of people. He loved white. He made a pagoda of white a porcelain pagoda to commemorate his parents, 270 feet high. And in every single aperture, every night, candles would glow and lanterns would glow so that the whole white edifice would speak of his passion for purity. What is this thing of whiteness? And this amazing porcelain tower, everyone comes to see it. Everyone, it's one of the great wonders of the world. So, of course, so I'm getting rather overexcited here, so I'll just have a little bit of water. Of course, my Jesuit goes to see it. And he writes the most extraordinary letter home to Paris. He writes, and they're translated into English and French and German. He writes th about this great, amazing porcelain whole edifice made out of porcelain. 
and his letter is read everywhere. But the most impact his letter has is when it's read aloud in Versailles. Because Louis XIV adores porcelain too. And Louis XIV, at this extraordinary moment, has a brand new mistress, Madame de Montespan. And he's going to show off to his brand new mistress. So what he does is to build a pavilion of porcelain, the Trianon de Porcelain, five minutes away from Versailles, where he can make love to his new mistress with Chinese silk walls. And the whole carapace of this building was blue and white porcelain. Every single urn, every single tile was to be of porcelain. But he can't make porcelain. He doesn't know how to make it. So it's from Delftware. It's earthenware. And it leaks. And the tiles fall off. And his mistress hates it. And it's a whole terrible disaster. It is, according to one incredibly catty person who goes to see it, contrafaçon, a total fake, a counterfeit. And Louis XIV doesn't like fake things at all. But he loves porcelain. He loves the idea of porcelain. So this is the English Trianon, the, the European version of the pagoda of porcelain. And who comes here too? My second enormous hero. So there's some very unlikely heroes. And this is my second hero. I'm afraid he isn't a very good looking man, but he's still absolutely wonderful. So you have to fall in love with this slightly jowly man. And this is my second hero, because he comes to Versailles and sees it too. And he is a young German mathematician. He's born into a noble family with no money. And as a child, he works out that the thing he's most passionate about is mathematics, the idea of numbers moving, of lucidity and clarity, and making things balance, and finding ways through problems. And so while he's very young, indeed, he works out an incredible equation. And this is the amazing equation he works out, which ludicrously, because I'm a real believer in, 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 in handling things, I decide that I need to buy this book in which this Latin mathematical equation is published. So I spend a vast amount of money. It's too embarrassing for words. Because <laughs> I can't read Latin, and I don't understand math. But I've got it. I've got it in my library. <laughs> And the point is, the point is that he loves sorting things out. And so he goes around Europe, and he sits at the feet of different people. He sits at the feet of, feet of Newton, who sketches how light works, how mirrors work, how lenses work, how lens. He goes and sits at the feet of Spinoza and Leibniz. And they work out that you can get the heat of the sun through a great lens and make things fire up, burn things, boil water and change materials. And so he makes this enormous, beautiful lens. It's as big as this picture. And it's in Dresden, and you have to leave Dallas tomorrow morning and go. It's the most extraordinary object. A young man making a lens. It's incredible. It's as beautiful as anything you'll ever see in your life. It's like Alice in Wonderland. You come towards it, and the whole of the world changes. And what's so great about this, he has this lens. He starts to experiment with materials. Because what does he want to do? He wants to make porcelain. And this is going to help him. So he goes to the one place he knows where there's one man who loves porcelain more than anyone else. He goes to Dresden. And Dresden is a golden city. And in Dresden, there is a terrible and amazing man. Augustus the Strong. Now, Augustus the Strong is a man of appetite. That's the polite way of saying that he has 217 illegitimate children. <laughs> for, for fun, he bends horseshoes in the evening with his hands, and he hunts elk. So he likes showing off. But he also likes objects. He likes things. He likes gold. He spends enough to want gold very much. But the big obsession, apart from women in his life, is porcelain. And he says that he has porcelain krankenheit, the maladie de porcelain. He has porcelain sickness. He says it's even worse than the love of oranges. And this is a man who builds 17 
orangeries to supply his palace. And when he becomes the emperor of Saxony, he has 112 pieces of porcelain in his possession. And when he dies, he has 38,422. He loves porcelain so much, he sends people to Amsterdam to buy it all the time. He has a dream of sending his own ships all the way from Dresden, all the way down the Elbe. You have to do a strange geographical thing about how utterly bonkers this is as an idea, all the way around the world in order to get more porcelain for his own palaces. He's a terrible man, but he loves the stuff. And he loves the stuff so much that he listens to Chernhaus, this great believer in porcelain, and he thinks about alchemy. He thinks about how you can get different materials, how to work together. And this is where one of the most unpleasant people I've had to spend time with comes into my story. I, the way I work is, is very straightforward, which is that I spend a ludicrous amount of time sort of trying to walk in people's footsteps. So I don't believe in doing anything with computers, which is such a waste of my time, but it's the way I do it. So I spend ludicrous, ludicrous amounts of time in archives. I go, go to places, and, and, and this man wasted more of my life than I can tell you. He was a young man called Bertger, and he was a fraudster. And I must say, I think the open white shirt tells you all you have to know about this <laughs> terrible young man. He believed that he could transmute lead into gold. He was a, 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 a fake alchemist. And he was captured by Augustus and locked up in this extraordinary castle in Meissen, in this cellar, and told to produce gold and porcelain. And, and the reason I dislike him so much is that I've spent... There are seven books of these. They're all about his complaints. He complains about everything. I mean, admittedly, he is, at this point, locked up in the cellar. <laughs> but he is... A, do you say whing, a whingy? A whinger? Are you allowed to say that? He whinges the whole time, page after page after page of complaint. But in his defense, he and, and, and my great mathematician have different skills. And Bertger understands materials. He uses his hands. He has that extraordinary tactility about bringing different kinds of materials together. Chernhaus has the idea, and this man, Bertger, complaints or no, understands how material works. And in these cellars, they use lenses, they use kilns, and finally, after 12 years, they make black porcelain. It's the wrong thing, but it's beautiful, and they're on the way. They're on the way to this extraordinary thing, because then, a year later, number five, they open the kiln, optimum album et pellucidum, the best white and translucent. They've done it. They've made porcelain in Europe. And this is it. It's extraordinary. It's beautiful. It lifts into your hands. In an incredible letter that my mathematician writes the same day, he says, it's like a narcissus. It's as beautiful as a narcissus. And when he says that, there's a tenderness about this, this process of coming towards this white object and the sense of the transients. You can almost see the smell of, of, of the transients of a narcissus. They've made it. They've made an extraordinary white object. And two days later, Chernhaus dies. And when they go to his room, all his books are gone. All his papers are gone. And Bertger goes that same night to Augustus the Strong and says, I have discovered porcelain. It becomes Bertger porcelain. And my man is discovered. And on the base of every single piece of mycin, they put the blue scimitars, the two rapiers, in this extraordinary rebus, which says, this is mycin. So power and purity have made the second white object. Mycin is my second white hill. And this is what happens to porcelain in Meissen. It's appalling. Everything gets turned to gold, but in a different way. The whiteness disappears. The idea of porcelain is transmuted 
into commodity and everything, dinner services and harlequins and clowns and pug dogs, and everything becomes what I call in my book, and I own this phrase, passive aggressive porcelain. But my third hill, my third hill takes me to England, to the birth of English porcelain. And it begins in a chemist shop where a young Quaker, a young man called William Cookworthy, is starting. And here he is in middle age, looking very solid indeed, a good, solid Quaker. He has a horse called Prudence. <laughs> but this lovely man, who I grew to absolutely love, and not for his looks, is extraordinary because where he lives is Plymouth on the south coast of England, a port. And I found that his neighbor, William's neighbor, has the first barometer in England. And every day for 40 years, he writes down how much rain falls in Plymouth. There's rain every day. So you have rain, greater rain, even greater rain. So for 40 years, William Cookworthy works in the landscape of mines of Cornwall, of looking into this great landscape. This is a geological map of the area where he worked. And he, everywhere he goes, he talks to people, and he looks at the ground under his feet. And because there's nothing to do in Plymouth in the evenings, he reads everything. And he reads that letter from the Jesuit. And he works out that up this hill where he was walking one day to take some ointments to an elderly lady that the white clay under his feet might possibly, possibly be the same clay as the Chinese. And he takes it home and he starts to experiment. And it takes him years and years and years. He builds a little kiln in his backyard. He makes test after test after test. And these are his shards that I found in an archive in the middle of nowhere. I'm pretty good at research. I have to say, in my own defense, the reason this book took so many years to do is archives. That's probably giving you my grave. <laughs> but he does it. And the reason he does it is that he, too, is obsessed not only by the idea of porcelain, but by the idea of white. He's transfixed by the idea that eternity is white, that the place in which he's going to be reunited with his lost wife and his dead children is a place of whiteness. His obsession with porcelain comes out of grief. What is this thing of whiteness? He's trying to make something white in the world. And finally, after another 40 years, March the 14th, 1768, C.F. Cookworthy Feckett. I made it. He makes the first piece of English porcelain. And on this piece of porcelain, he puts the coat of arms of Plymouth, where he's been living, in cobalt. And it runs, and the mug weighs an absolute ton. And do you know what it is? It's a Devon cider tankard. It's already out of date but it's such an object of tenderness. He's made porcelain happen in the world. And he builds a little factory, and he makes tankards, and he makes cows out of porcelain sitting down in the grass. And here he is, reading scripture in his chair. And then he makes a terrible mistake. He tries to patent it. He sends out a patent that he is now the inventor of porcelain. And as soon as he does that, someone notices. It's Wedgwood in Stoke-on-Trent. And Wedgwood, that great, unbelievable entrepreneur, thinker, maker of ceramics for the whole of Europe, friend of poets, friend of the queen, decides to destroy Cookworthy. And he does totally destroy him. Because Wedgwood wants all white clay. He's seen the possibility of porcelain. And he wants the power to own it all. And he's heard an extraordinary rumor that on the other side 
of the world in Cherokee country, in the Appalachian Mountains, in no man's land, as he calls it, there is being seen white clay, that the Cherokees, Indians, are using white clay for ceremonial and ritual purposes. And so he sends an adventurer, Thomas Griffiths, all the way across there to the mountains in order to buy up that white hill where white clay comes from. And so I, too, take myself up into the Appalachian Mountains with a photocopy of a journal. And I go up, and I find the red hills. And then I find the place where, in 1770, a terrible adventurer sat down and tricked the Cherokee Indians to sell all their white clay for a promise that they would come back and bring porcelain. And this is all that's left, a tiny seam of white clay. And because I am hugely angered by this thing, I took with me an extremely beautiful piece of Wedgwood Ware and took it back to the place as an act of restitution. It's a terrible story of, 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 of colonialism. And, and this white clay was used for incredibly important rituals by, by this, this particular community. And what Wedgwood does is, is to take it all away. And all those famous, amazing porcelain objects that Wedgwood makes have one tiny speck of of Cherokee clay in them. And this is what happens to Cornwall. All the mountains get eviscerated for white clay. And the villagers become workers. And the clay goes to Stoke-on-Trent, which becomes a city where day and night become as one, because it's now the center of all white pottery in the world, like Jingda Jen, and wherever you look, there are children ankle deep in white dust. And what I thought I'd done at this point, after several years of trying to do my pilgrimage to the white hills of Jingda Jen and of Meissen and of Cornwall, and unexpectedly of the Appalachians, was that I would do a very beautiful. Um, poetic coda to my book that I would, I would end by talking about modernism on a kind of upbeat, I made it sound so depressing, this book. I do this upbeat end to the book, and I talk about my love for, for, for the Bauhaus and for Malevich, who made amazing pots during the Russian Revolution. And I, I would talk about repetition and, and how, how this aesthetic of, of, of standardization could also be seen as the precursor of lots of beautiful proto-minimalism, I, I would do this beautiful coda. But because I can't sleep, as I think I've mentioned before, in the middle of the night, I'm thinking about the designer Wilhelm Wagenfeld, who, who worked at the Bauhaus. And I'm thinking about all the factories. And I've worked out that in the list of places he's worked, that there was a factory that I just didn't know about called Alach, that was set up in 1938 in the suburbs of Munich. So I go to the suburbs of Munich, and I find the derelict factory, and I ignore the Teutonic warning to keep out, and I climb over the fence. No one follows me. And I go and open the door, and it's a ruined porcelain factory. And I find out more that in 1938, this factory was established by members of the SS to make pure white porcelain, because pure white porcelain is an Aryan material, because porcelain is, of course, porcelain. It's German. And that the objects they want to make are objects which are inflected by proper German discipline. And that Himmler sees this porcelain and decides that he wants it so much that he, too, will take over the factory. And in 1940, he moves it to Dachau concentration camp, where pure white porcelain can be made. Alach porcelain is so successful that as the Reich 
moves to the east and the ghettos are liquidated and Poland becomes German, that Alak porcelain shops are set up so that people can buy pure white porcelain. And Himmler loves his factory. He brings visitors to the concentration camp to see and choose porcelain. And they choose extraordinary things because what are made are vessels and what are made are figures, figures of Nazi functionaries, figures of German history, animals. And some objects are made only for the members of the SS who run the concentration camps. The fencer was only given to people who were responsible for the Holocaust. Here is Heydrich, who established the Wannsee Conference and killed three million people with his pure white porcelain object, which he loved. And here is Hitler being shown his birthday present, which has just arrived from the Alach porcelain factory in Dachau. How do you make sense of that? I spend time in this archive in Dachau. And the archivist says to me that they've just been given an Alach figure, and they bring it out. It's still wrapped in newspaper, and I unwrap it. And it's Bambi. And I turn it over, and there's the mark. And the mark is the double S of the SS, which, of course, is a transposition of the Meissen mark. It's pure German Aryan porcelain. And what do you do when you handle an object of such contamination? It's profoundly sentimental. It's profoundly kitsch. And the cost, suddenly, of obsession with porcelain rolls you back through history. It rolls you all the way back to that first Chinese emperor who killed so many people to make that pure white jug. It takes you to Augustus the Strong and his obsession, his maladie de porcelain, and it brings you up close to the cost of porcelain at this moment. The fact that I find in these documents that had never been looked at, that they were still supplying coal in May 1945 for the Alach porcelain factory when there was no coal going to the crematorium in the death camp. What is this thing of whiteness? Well, what I do is make things. I make porcelain. And I try and put the porcelain I make in the world. It's, it's my practice. I use white porcelain day in and day out. And I try and find places for porcelain, places to make my porcelain work. And so I put porcelain in the ground, back as the shards came from the ground. This is an archive piece I made for the University of Cambridge, a series of vitrines that you walk over as you go into a building. It's a series of objects and vessels and broken shards, which you can look at or ignore, because that's what you can do with archives. You can walk over them, you can forget them, or you can pay attention to them. What are you going to do with your history? And I make things to go in the air. This is atmosphere a piece I've made for a new, beautiful museum by the sea. It's called Turner Contemporary. It was built on the spot where Turner used to paint seascapes, just next to the sea. It's a series of vitrines which hang in the air like, like cloudscapes. And as the light changes, things come and they go. They recede and they become clearer. 
and you lie on the floor and look up and you see one thing, or you ignore it, you walk past. And sometimes, even in England, the sun shines. This is my sunny picture in England. And I put things in vitrines. Now, I have a relationship with vitrines. I spent a very long time on my last journey into my lost family thinking about the places where my collection of Netsuke I'd inherited had lived. All those vitrines from Belle Epoque, Paris, surrounded by amazing Degas and Manet and Monet and Sisley and Moreau. A vitrine in a palace in Vienna on the Ringstrasse, where my grandmother grew up, where there was a different kind of storytelling about objects, but where a vitrine was opened in the evenings by a maid and Netsuke were played with, and a vitrine after the horror of the war in Tokyo, where I meet my great uncle, and a vitrine has a very different way of thinking about what happens with an object when it's put somewhere down in the world and it is stilled, it's paused, it's allowed a space, a sculptural space, just to be for a moment. So that's why I use vitrines. But I also use vitrines because it's about music, it's about the score, it's about hearing objects. This is a piece called Composition for Three Voices, which I've just made for an exhibition in Los Angeles. It's a series of small white pots and lead and gold, three voices, three materials, three sounds, a repetition, I hope, as clear as any Philip Glass score. So objects have sound. Objects have a kind of intensity of oral perception. Where do you put them in the world? Well, one of the things I do is to try and find the ways you can repeat gestures in the world, repeat sounds. So this is a piece called The 10,000 Things for John Cage, where there are 20 aluminum boxes, each with a piece of Corten steel and black pots, black porcelain. So repetitions and pauses. And here is my paean as an Englishman to the LA sky. It's called a lecture on the weather because my feeling is there is no difference at all in the weather in LA. <laughs> but I had an invitation when I was just finishing my book from the Kunsthistorische Museum in Vienna. It's one of the great museums in the world. It has unparalleled collections. It's on the Ringstrasse. It's a great museum. I have problems with the Kunsthistorische Museum like I have problems with Vienna. It's the museum where, in the weeks after the Anschluss, every single picture that belonged to my family and every piece of furniture was taken for assessment by curators and art historians. But they invited me to make a piece of work for a small neoclassical temple they have in a park, the Volksgarten, just across the way. It's a very beautiful small space. And they said, you can do anything you want here. Make something. The door is open at 9 and closes at 6 as a guard. And everyone wanders in and out. It's a piece of public art. So I thought with great deliberation. What do I make for Vienna? And what I made was this installation called Lichtzwang. It's a title that's taken from a very beautiful poem by the Romanian-born Jewish poet Celan. And Celan is an extraordinary figure his poems, as he gets older and older, 
become more and more fragmented. There's more and more white space around his poems. And his poems have a problem with the German language. They get fragmented. He makes new words up. They're more cries and exhalations than lucid words. But he's the poet of white. He writes all the time about the intensity of white. White for him is homecoming. It's the inability to go home. He talks about the white he'll never see of his mother's hair. White runs all the way like light through his poems. So I made an installation which is his poem in porcelain. And I wrote on the wall the poem in German and in English. And for nine months, people came and went, and mothers with their kids and tramps with a bottle of beer and a not very good dance troupe made a not very good dance piece. And the critics hated it, of course. But for nine months, there was an installation and a poem in Vienna. It's a kind of homecoming. Because what do you do if you feel that objects are homeless? Where do they belong in the world? How can you make them rest with intelligence for a moment and give them some kind of conviction of where they can question you and question themselves? How can you use this material? This is my obsession. This is my white road. And these are the pieces that I make. I use porcelain. And sometimes it's white. And sometimes my porcelain is now black. But always, at the heart of it, is this knowledge Ultimately, in the end, any journey to white will end up with this, which is something which is broken. And that's its strength. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I, I got down as if to run away immediately from everything. So th thank you very much for that response. I, th 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 I, I've been told by Anna that, that there's an opportunity for questions. If anyone, you may all just, there's actually very nice wine out there. So that you may actually choose not. No, there is a, there's a, a brave question from the back. Uh, would you care to perhaps uh, give a little uh scientific uh, background on how porcelain is made, the vitrification, that sort of thing, people who are not quite sure what exactly porcelain is. Well, the, the, what is porcelain? Well, historically, porcelain is made up of two different kinds of material, the Chinese porcelain, uh, petunce and kaolin, which are these two porcelain, stone and porcelain, kaolin, which have to be brought together. And in this wonderful poetic way, uh, all, the, all the historians way back talked about it as flesh and bones. You need both in order to, to make a material which, of course, has to be fired to incredible, incredible temperatures in order to achieve the translucence, which actually defines porcelain. Are you a maker of porcelain? Not since high school, but yeah, no. <laughs> but all porcelains are slightly different. And I use an incredibly beautiful and seductive porcelain from France, Limoges. And that's hugely sentimental. It's, pro it's just that I live in South London, which is not the most inspiring place in the world. So the idea of having Limoges, which speaks to me of warmth and very good wine, somewhere in my studio means that that's my preferred kind of clay. Gentlemen. To what extent is your research um, did the use of bone ash come in? Would you consider that porcelain, or are you looking at more a purer sense of porcelain? I, I, I'm being asked about bone ash. Well, that, that's interesting because uh, I, I'm looking at a very particular journey through a very kind of pure, uh, pure use of the material. The thing is that along the way, of course, over this thousand years of this history, people have attempted all kinds of ways of trying to make white pots. 
bone ash is one. They've also tried to grind up glass in order to try and make porcelain. They're all along the history, there, there's a whole um, extraordinary landscape of people who despair ever of making it and try all kinds of things. And I very happily put myself in this lineage of people who endlessly despair about the material. <laughs> I'm being asked about what leads leading me towards black. Um, it's still an obsession with white. It, this is the, working with black is, is is totally bound up with whiteness, um, and uh, I'm finding it very difficult to articulate why at this moment in my life I'm using these black, extraordinarily beautiful, I think, black glazes so intensely. Um, but it's something about shadows. It's something about um, this uh, almost somatic bodily experience of being near black objects, which seems to me very challenging for me and, and, and profoundly new. My genuine answer is I haven't a clue. <laughs> I think that probably nails it. I haven't a clue. I'll say it out loud. <laughs> I, I'm very happy to be in conversation with Pollock, obviously. I mean, the, for, for me, of course, my, my relationship, my, the, my relationship as, a, as an artist um, with, uh, with materiality um, is profoundly about the body. And one of the things that, that I do, of course, is, is I make everything. So, I, you know, every single object that, I, that, I, is, that are in these huge installations, I, I make. It's my own vessel. But what I'm doing when I'm doing it is not just using my hands. It's not just that somatic thing. Because actually, these vessels that I'm making also have an internal volume. They have a kind of breath within them. They have a kind of stillness within them. So they're also simultaneously for me a kind of language, a kind of speaking. So when I have a huge installation of, 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 of objects, of porcelain vessels, it's also it's a kind of poetry, a kind of speaking. And so it's not just about the arm or the hand or the shoulder, but it's also spoken for me or breathed out. And I find that difficult to say, except it's obviously there is something going on with the fact that I feel the need the compulsion, the obsession to write as well as make, and those two things do interconnect totally in my practice. I am a writer, I am an artist, but I'm one person. <laughs> so the two things happen often simultaneously. This lady here. Yeah, um, I was related to that writing and, and, and <coughs> making the course. How do you? How do you divide your time between the two, and do you find that they influence each other in, in the process? I, I'm being asked how I divide my time between the two, the two things of white pages and white clay. Um, um, well, very few days go past when I haven't made something and I haven't written something. So it can get more complicated than that because writing a book, being on a journey which takes you into deep into research, deep into this attempt to bring people back to life or bring back stories or encounters means that you're out of the studio a lot. 
but when I'm actually writing, I think of myself as making. <laughs> and I know I, I once saw myself on film, and I used my hands all the time, so I'm trying to keep trying to be embarrassed about this, but, but, actually, but, but actually the way I write is entirely a kind of making. So the two things are very, very powerfully linked. And, um, and the compulsion to write and the compulsion to make. I have exhibitions, I have books. You know, sometimes I just have to work all night for weeks or for years. But you know what? I can recommend coffee. You know, it's, <laughs> it, it's, it's nothing wrong with it. Don't believe what they say. It's really, really good for you. <laughs> I think that's it. I think it's wine. I think, Jeremy, don't you think we're done? We're done. Thank you.